Thank you, Kate. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, as this, I understand, is the first of four public events in the Modern Language Teachers Association of uh, WA Languages in the mainstream program, <laughs> of which the Liberal National Government, through the Office of Multicultural Interests, is really proud to support. And uh, the reason we do that is uh, because the, the association is very hard working, of course. Uh, but the subject matter of languages, uh, not just in the schools and the community, is uh, very important, not only for cultural uh, and uh, linguistic, uh, but also, importantly, for economic reasons. So I'd like to talk about it a bit today with my treasures hat on. Uh, and uh, when I came in uh, to uh, government as it was appointed the Minister of Multicultural Interests, uh, I, of course, had uh, it... I was chosen largely, uh, I suppose, because I'm, I'm a migrant myself. Uh, but my electorate of Riverton is very multicultural and uh, has a large uh, number in a diverse community. In the schools now, in, in the electorate of Riverton, we often get 60 nationalities in a school in more languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we put some effort into finding out what our role in uh, in uh, multicultural interest was. And one thing that came up was, uh, I was my, my uh, electorate has a large Chinese population. Uh, I had been active in the, uh, the main Chinese group called Chenghua for some time. And I noticed that they had two schools in my electorate, and one at, uh, at that time was at Parkwood Primary, we moved to Ross Moyne, the other one was at Leamy. Had over, uh, in its three schools actually, had 1,500 kids studying Mandarin in the uh, Saturday morning, very studiously. And I can remember when my son was young, way, way back, we did the same thing at the same school to him. Uh, and uh, his mother is Chinese, and she wanted him to share in the language of her culture. And of course, Mandarin's a very important language. It was very hard. He couldn't sit still. Uh, he would rather out on Saturday morning going out and playing football or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and also he struggled because of uh, a lot of the people in the classes were had greater in-house uh, contact with the language, particularly the Tongan language. And I, I could see that thing. And then we saw that over the last 10 years, uh, uh, Oli and myself saw that there has been a mass increase in the number of people from overseas. Uh, here in Western Australia, in fact, we've had a 30% uh, increase in our population in 10 years. Uh, traditionally, of course, people, we've always been a migrant nation, uh, but most of the migrants in the past came from English-speaking backgrounds, mainly the U United Kingdom, of course, and South Africa, uh, and, and uh, similar places. But this time, they came from everywhere, mm -hmm. including Asia. Uh, uh, primarily Asia, but even the, let's say, the South Asians, uh, come from Kenya, Fiji, Malaysia, Singapore, UK, everywhere. Okay? It has transformed the ethnic mix of Western Australia. Uh, other states are, uh, have been that way forever, but it's transformed that. And we've had a, a huge increase in people from everywhere in the world. So in speaking with them, the, my task was to assist them put it simply, in becoming good West Australians. That, that was my task. And what are uh, the challenges they face in becoming West Australians? There's a whole range of things, but one of them is to make sure, particularly important to new migrants, is to the children, they pass on the culture. And to understand the culture, you, it's the language. So we uh, had this old program that had been going for 30 years called the Community Language Program had about a, a bucket of money, cut around a million dollars. It uh, hadn't been reviewed for 30 years that we found. Its purpose had been obscure, hard to find out what it was. But it was funny in Chinghua for a long time. And I could see the benefits of that. Uh, and uh, other, other groups had been using it, the Polish community had used it quite extensively. It was used, but it was very limited. Uh, and uh, a great deal of the money was being used not for community languages, that is, from community groups for after hours language training, uh, but was using to supplement mainstream education of certain languages in the schools, private and public. 
So we, 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 we decided after review to revamp it uh, and to focus on community language programs. Now, some of the criticisms of that was these after-school community cares are just babysitting. That's, that was a criticism. Uh, to some extent, that's a risk, because uh, especially Saturday morning, you want to put your kid in the school and then nick off to do, you know, everyone has a busy life. Uh, and we had to be cognizant of that. Uh, so we had a review and we revamped it and we put a, uh, we increased the amount of money, the number of schools, uh, but we also did something I think very important, and this is, I got, had to give credit to the people from OMI and the advisory group uh, for this. We put a lot of effort and a lot of money into teacher training, uh, institutional development of the schools themselves, uh, and uh, also materials. Last Yesterday was in, uh, in the National State Library. Uh, opening up uh, the, uh, the reference material for remote, for the community languages schools, for languages wide-ranging. Uh, and uh, so we put a lot of effort to making sure the quality uh, of the teachers, the materials, the institutions, uh, and, and the feedback, in other words, in the schools was, uh, that was improved. So it wouldn't become, a, 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 it would, would not be a, a, a babysitting exercise. And we linked very much with Victoria, who is very advanced in, uh, on this area. Uh, and we've seen just an explosion in the number of schools. Uh, uh, we now have 81 community language schools involved, and we're working with some fun, some uh, are, are <coughs> developing their, uh, their capacity, uh, and teaching some 51 languages uh, that teach an estimated 6,000 children, adults and children. That's a very large 180% uh, increase over two years. What's the importance of the community language program? Uh, it is, as I said, a major mechanism by which communities pass on their culture and language to the children and to the members of the community. Uh, it, of course, also provides a meeting place for new migrants, uh, a, a meeting place for people of similar backgrounds and whatnot. It's always important. Uh, but it also, importantly for the wider community, teaches languages that otherwise could not be taught. Uh, the formal education system, I think, has five or six. You, you know how many of those are. They're the mainstream languages. Uh, and, uh, but you can only, and, and they have to have, let's say, each school can only have maybe one, maybe two languages, not, not that many. Can't teach the breadth and depth of languages, 51 languages, a study here. And you never know which one. So our, our program now uh, teaches Igbo, which I think is a Nigerian language, Swahili, which is a very large language in uh, East Africa, Dinka, which I think is one from Sudan, uh, Hakka, which is my wife's language, uh, is a, a Chinese dialect, very important. Hakkas are everywhere in the world. They're the kind of entrepreneurial type. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a whole range of other languages. Uh, it's been a big exercise to, to be able to get the resource material for those individual languages. You can do French and Spanish, that's very simple, because it's all very easily available. But where do you get resource material for Dinka? Uh, we find it. Uh, and, the, and, and so the, uh, we've developed these things. Besides the cultural and uh, uh, community aspect, if you are to uh, go out in the world. You know, Western Australia is a trading state. 80 to 90 percent of our production, agriculture, mining, tourism, are exported by people importing import and export. We will continue to be so. So the question then comes down to how can you link with the world best? Uh, and to link with the world best, you have to have what uh, the, uh, my notes say as cultural agility. Uh, and, uh, and that is, you have to be able to get some kind of conscious, some understanding of the people you trade with. Sometimes it's simple if you're dealing with money, that's just or electronics, that's very simple. But if you're out there selling wheat to China or selling beef, to the Middle East, or looking for minerals in East Africa, uh, which we do a lot, you have to go beyond the electronics and deal with the society. 
Uh, and in order to understand uh, uh, if you're there just for a short period of time on a contract uh, to put a few holes in the ground and provide the data to somebody, but if you're going to invest in a mine, let's say, in Uganda, uh, you're going to be there for a while. Uh, and you have to be able to understand the social, political, economic context for the long haul. And in order to do that, and these countries are as diverse as the world is diverse almost, you have to understand some of the languages. You cannot understand an economic, political structure without good, a good linguistic understanding of the community you dwell in. And where do you, if so, if someone is going to go to uh, Sudan, which we have quite a few people going for various reasons, how are you going to understand the place? Where are you going to study Dinka? Well, our community language program. Uh, and uh, Hakka uh, is mainly a community-based uh, issue. Uh, but other languages like uh, that we, we study, uh, indeed, take the Polish language. Uh, it's very, you know, Poland's a big country. Uh, uh, it uh, has a significant number of uh, Polish people in the community. The school has focused on passing the culture on, uh, and, uh, but you simply won't be able to go find very many places if you wanted to study Polish. For instance, you wanted to open, like a friend of mine did, a mine in Poland, or a brewery in Poland, which another acquaintance of mine did. Uh, where would you brush up in Polish but the Polish school? Some you might be able to find some in TAFE and, and, and other areas. Uh, and one of the important things that I've seen as uh, through my life, and, and I've worked extensively in Asia uh, uh, and around the world uh, and, and a, as an economist uh, before I got into politics, was that uh, when you uh, open up a new country, whether it be India, <coughs> or let's say uh, we start developing relationships with new countries, we did this all those years ago with Japan, and, uh, then, uh, of course, in China uh, and Southeast Asia, and of course now increasingly with India, uh, we need to find people in our community who have uh, interest, knowledge in those communities. Uh, Japan was very difficult because there wasn't too many people of Japanese origin here in West Australia. It just wasn't. Uh, so the, the very smart people at the time in Western Australia, Charlie Court and others, decided, well, we got to do something about that. And they very smartly decided that we need to do a number of things to learn the Japanese culture. So one thing they did is set up the Department of Econ in the Department of Economics at the UWA, a school of economics in Japanese language. <coughs> they took the economics and the language together. Uh, and that has spawned most of the ambassadors from Australia to Japan from that program. And they also said, well, what we have to do is also to get to know each other, we have to encourage the study of Japanese in our schools. So uh, they did that. Uh, and indeed, Jap Japanese is either first or second. It varies around, that, around the top of uh, languages studied in our schools, both private and public. Quite a significant outcome, given the, that uh, there isn't too many people of Japanese descent here, though their numbers are growing. Uh, and it's largely a trading partner issue rather than cultural issues. After that, of course, China came in. And then we, businesses from Australia, have tried to link with China, obviously. Uh, the big side of town, they have no, no problem. But when you notice and you see that people linking with China, they have certain generalized characteristics. First, they're often uh, locally born people, Chinese background, who had some Chinese training. Sometimes they're from Malaysia, for instance, and they might, like my wife, grow up with Hakka Hokkien, but they understand the tones, they pick up the language, and they are our emissaries in China. But why are they able to do that? Mm, their cultural background might help, but actually it's so, the language backgrounds that provide the linkages for that. Uh, and it's different. It's, it's, you cannot do business of any substance in China without Mandarin. Just not possible. Uh, uh, it's possible, but you could, or could also lose a lot of money. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and you can get lost. Uh, and you can see that uh, going. And same thing in Southeast Asia. 
uh, a large amount of our linkages, whether they're in agriculture or uh, other uh, transactions with uh, Indonesia or, or uh, less so, but still Malaysia or, or indeed the Philippines, it's language that provides the capacity to understand the intricacies of a society and the business environment that is necessary to do so. And increasingly, uh, of course, with our increasing importance with India, uh, India is a big country, but our trade links are very, very limited there for some reason. Overwhelm is dominated by gold. Uh, luckily, Indian women love gold, and we produce a lot of it, so we sell it to a lot to them. But it dominates the relationship, uh, the transaction. But it, it, it will change dramatically over a period of time. It's a, a country with huge potential, uh, and, and very uh, large, of course, but has a lot of potential for growth or need for growth. And where we sit there perfectly in, in terms of providing some services and, and goods and services to it. It's a very complex country, as you might know. It has 22 official languages, including English. Uh, and uh, they vary immensely. Uh, one thing that you uh, would gather from the Indian people is they sit down and they often speak three or four of their own languages, including English. It's just incredible linguistic diversity, not only in the community, but also in the public. And these languages are different, very different, just like uh, uh, some of the older languages in China. And how and dealing with India and peering through the regulation Raj and the troubles with that requires a knowledge of India that some of us can pick up, but it's always going to be a strange and different language, a strange and, 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 and odd language if you don't understand at least some of the languages, India and others. Uh, and where are we going to get the people with the knowledge of Punjabi or, or Tamil or uh, Malawi? or one of those languages, uh, Hindi. Well, the only way you can study any of those languages except Hindi, perhaps, is in the community language programs. And we have them in all of them. Uh, and they will be increasingly important. Uh, and sometimes you have to know more than one. So going forward, as in the past, language has been a necessary uh, part of doing business with Asia and our neighbors in the world. Uh, and a small trading state like Western Australia, and it will ever be so, uh, because we produce too much to, uh, and we produce things that we cannot process. We will never be self-sufficient, and most of it, nor do we really want to, because they pay more than we would. Uh, and uh, languages are going to be important for it. But we have a problem in Australia. We are very monolinguistic. Uh, and, and it is not part of our culture like you see in other places of the world, like India, like China, indeed. Uh, that's changing, but in the past they spoke many dialects, or Malaysia, uh, or Europe, uh, particularly places like Switzerland, or, or Sweden, or Norway, where it is just natural and expected to uh, speak a multiplicity of languages, fluent. Uh, and uh, it is not part of our curriculum. We've had troubles within our curriculum, though that the government does, has allocated in this block money for education, for schools, but a large increasing, but we've given students more choice. And that choice has led to a diminution in the number of kids studying language in our schools, both at primary school and at high school and at universities. In the old days, of course, at the universities, like me, I had to study a language. Uh, indeed, in schools, I had to study Latin. Uh, I went to Catholic school. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, that was for, I had to go to church. You know, it was all mine back then. Uh, but that has some really good advantages, I'm telling you. So it's not just these modern languages. Uh, but we have a culture that we have to uh, overcome uh, to, uh, uh, to encourage people to pick up the languages as part of the mainstream and as an essential part of education. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, uh, languages are difficult. And uh, in our system where we want to maximize our DE or ATAR score, you're, the students are always trying to look at the uh, they route of least resistant and largest number of, of score. Mm -hmm. And languages often are, are the hardest side of it, particularly things like Mandarin, so they, they go away from it. Uh, and 
that is that is life. You, you can make languages interesting, but you can't necessarily make them easy. Uh, and so we have to overcome that. So we've gone back uh, as a government and are mandating, I think it's in year three, all kids in primary public school will have to study a language. And we plan to move it up uh, throughout primary school. And then by the time we get there, we'll worry about it and try to inculcate it in secondary schools. Uh, and it is, and we have to, of course, give them choice. We can't cover all the languages. This so community language program will always be very, very vital, both for economic and cultural reasons. But we have to. There is a real problem in education, as I've noticed, in that uh, 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 some languages are more difficult than others. And also, you have to concentrate, you have to have to build up a large amount of capacity in the teachers of a language. And you can't just simply go from Italian used to be the most popular, oh, let's shift to Indonesian, and let's go to Mandarin now, which is what we've actually done to some extent. Because one person can't teach them all well. And so you, you, have, to, you have to choose a few languages to stick with them. And you have to allow the schools to do this. So there's some problems in tooling up and getting adequate numbers of teachers uh, uh, and whatnot. But and the one that I focused on, not surprisingly, has been Mandarin. It's, uh, economic, uh, it's vital for our economic uh, future. It's also a bloody difficult one. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's, it's, it's very hard. I saw it personally. Uh, my son was in the schools, Chunghua School, so you get the Australians who never heard a town or language struggle. And then you get him, uh, my son, who's his mother yelled at him in Hokkien or Hakka, so he understood some of it because after he got hit in the head, he, he understood. <laughs> Uh, and, and then the third thing is people who spoke, who had, whose parents spoke Mandarin at home. That's hard. You can't compete. You can't work with them. So that's, I think, the Chinese language teachers are working through on, the, on those issues. But there's a, and I think they have some of the people from Roberta might be here. Uh, there's a school in uh, uh, Bull Creek uh, and, uh, that decided uh, we gave them $50,000. Yeah, good. Uh, uh, to, to be the hub for Mandarin for the Ross Moyne Feeder District. And Tim is here, the principal? No. Tim Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, he's not here. Okay. He, uh, I don't think he spoke or he wasn't a linguistic person before that. No, uh, he said that politely. Yep. And, uh, but he worked through a, and with the team a brilliant way and to solve this problem these issues about diversity, is instead of teaching, I think, Mandarin or in, uh, to the kids, they teach immersion program in uh, a range of other subjects, like I thought I went to, I think I saw a science class and a social uh, or geography class. So they teach mainstream classes, immersion in Mandarin, studying from preschool and working their, their way out. And you see these little Australian kids, they, well, they understand the edicts from the teachers very clearly, and when they, you, you can see they comprehend. And it's a way, the, the way that the, it works is, I think, that if all the kids have to study and learn this material, and uh, whether they're Chinese or Chinese introduced or not, uh, and if they have do it all in, uh, from kindergarten or preschool in Mandarin, they pick it up with the brains, they absorb it almost instantaneously, uh, and they become very fluent in, through the years. It's just a brilliant teaching methodology, methodology that has worked brilliantly and overcomes the challenges. So, so my point here is that we have to invest in our <coughs> teachers, invest in our mechanisms to teach education, to, to educate our children and overcome the challenges of various languages. Uh, and it is absolutely vital for us, and uh, we need to make the investment from the government, and we are doing so. Uh, and uh, it is also an investment not for, just for maintaining the culture of our, of our new communities, but as important uh, for our economic future. Uh, and uh, it's been uh, one of the highlights, I might say, of my period as the Minister of Cultural Cultural Interests, uh, to be able to revitalize the community language program, not only for the various communities uh, in the community, but also for its contribution to the future of Western Australia. Thank you very much.